Okay, uh, let's see if this all works. Um, greetings everyone uh, here in person in Glasgow and online from wherever you may be. Um, my name is John Treat. I'm with Trade Unions for Energy Democracy based at the School for Labor and Urban Studies in New York, uh, part of the City University of New York. Um, very pleased to welcome you all to this meeting, uh, Corporations Can't Deliver on Climate Toward Global Public Goods. Uh, this is the second of two sessions being hosted today under this uh, title, carrying forward this discussion. We've organized two sessions at different times a day to accommodate as many people as we can from around the world as possible. Um, pleased to be able to say that we have uh, organized this in partnership with the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, uh, Public Services International, the Scottish Trades Union Congress, and uh, TUED, Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. Um, the session this morning had a very, I think, rich and interesting and provocative and, and meaty discussion that got into some of the important questions around you know, what's, what kind of political ideas and structures and strategies we need to really shift the conversation given the changes in, in power and globalization that, that have taken place over the last uh, couple of decades and now are sort of possibly undergoing another moment of change in the wake of the COVID crisis. And as we're all kind of thinking about what, what lessons may be drawn out of that, and are there lessons there that can help us tackle this accelerating uh, climate emergency? Um, I won't say anything more than that. We'll get right into the speakers that are on our panel this evening. Um, uh, I will hand over first to uh, my colleague at TUED, Sean Sweeney. Uh, he, Sean is the TUED coordinator, and he will frame the discussion, and then we'll move to some of the other speakers that we have this evening. We'll try to have time for contributions and discussion later in the meeting, so you can try to prepare your thoughts for that. Thanks, John. Uh, the microphone is turned up. I believe STUC1 needs to be turned on. I'm, you want me to mute? Yeah. Okay. So now we're working on this. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. That's on me. Okay. Okay. I'm muted. <laughs> you want to okay. um, make sure this is Do you want to be just just the left one? Uh huh. And you do external headphones. This one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. So I don't have to listen to myself then. <laughs> Everybody else has to. <laughs> so why did we think this meeting was important at COP26 with so much else going on? Um, first of all. I want to try to summarize the sort of evolution of the trade union debates on climate, and that's not going to be easy to do in two minutes, but I'll do my best. I mean, back in the, in the mid-2000s, unions started attending the COPs. So they attended the early COPs and really was bewildered by the experience and felt because they were weak and there were very little interest in the organized trade union movement, with some exceptions in climate change, they latched on to the term just transition, which came out of the US trade union movement. It was a broad concept, which uh, I think we're all familiar with, so I won't take time explaining, except to say it was a very much a safety net approach. Workers should not have to make a choice uh, of supporting climate change and, their, and giving up their job, but they should be part of an integrated approach to uh, the transition to a low carbon future. Then along comes the green jobs debate around about 2007, 2008. I was one of the co-authors of the United Nations Environment Program's first global green jobs study. Um, I won't tell you what's in it and why UNEP never came back to us again. That's a story for another day. Um, but then was the financial crash and then the green, green and inclusive growth narrative grew out of that. 
it was a sort of a build back better narrative of the time, but it was green and inclusive growth. The World Bank adopted it in 2012. And it became very much part of the neoliberal agenda. And what we, when we started CHUED uh, um, nine years ago, it was based on a, a visceral response by Latin American trade unions at the Rio plus 20 talks where unions said, we don't want any of this privatization garbage. They're breaking up the public uh, industries. They're, they're privatizing public rail. And then they're preaching to us about green mobility. They're breaking down public services and then et cetera. So there was a, there was a reaction. And the trade unions that were anchored in the North, for the most part, didn't know how to handle it because they had gone along with this green growth agenda that was going to produce millions and millions and endless millions of green jobs. And our job as a movement was to get a seat at the table, resurrect some degree of social dialogue, particularly pertinent in the European context, and generally speaking, cheer on that wing of capital that was, had seen the light on climate change and understood that the adversarial and um, aggressive neoliberal agenda of the early 80s and, and early to the early 90s was a thing of the past, that we're all stakeholders now. And so we fast forward even further to the COVID. And what we tried to do in Chewit, sorry, is to say, what the trade union movement needs is a programmatic shift. It needs to get away from this minimal program and start talking about a much more transformative agenda. Why did we say that? First of all, the climate targets were routinely missed. So if we're talking about climate change, we can't just keep talking about ambition and hope that higher targets is gonna produce better results. It doesn't produce better results. There's no evidence to show that's the case. The other reason was the transition that was going through was based on liberalization and privatization of energy markets and the undermining of public systems who we felt were best prepared actually to deliver certainly on decarbonization of electricity and transport because they had the, they had the whole system integrated and they could plan their way to a different future. But no, it was about disrupting the large energy companies, privatizing them or marketizing them when they were still in public hands. We felt this was a catastrophic um, miscalculation by the global elite in terms of its capacity to deliver on climate change. Add to that the other catastrophe, which was the carbon price idea. 20 something years ago, they said, well, if we put a price on carbon, everybody's gonna be able to move money around and then we can have various mechanisms that's gonna help the global south. And that has turned out to be an absolute disaster, complete and utter failure. And I think every trade unionist who has a public uh, voice should be saying that at the opening of their speech before they start talking about a seat at the table and just transition and the need for social dialogue. There needs to be a far more upfront recognition of the, the what I consider to be the greatest policy failure ever, which is a sort of a, a, a para paraphrase sort of of what Lord Stern said when he said climate change was the greatest market failure ever. It's, this is a policy failure. Now we get to the COVID period. And what we found is what we've done is we've shown uh, we're working with PSI, the ITF, very uh, affiliate unions. We're beginning to be develop programmatic alternatives, not just slogans, not just complaints, but laying out plans for transition. The most recent being just a few days in this room, we adopted the trade union program for a public low carbon energy future, which is not just again, we want it to be public, it's how we can make it public again, dissolve uh, electricity, wholesale, retail and capacity markets, reverse neoliberal laws, I don't need to go through the whole program, it's there. But we didn't have, a, we still don't have an overarching narrative to counter what is coming out of the World Economic Forum and these spaces around COP26, which is the great reset that you know we're all part of the solution. And what we need to do is to continue to mobilize the private sector to de-risk investments in the green economy. We don't have an effective narrative to that. And the just transition narrative as currently put forward is not an alternative. It just says, the transition is in your hands, but don't forget about us. Don't leave us behind as workers. We think that's inadequate, uh, both in terms of what's going on with the climate and also the, uh, the current uh, trends 
And more ambition is not going to solve that problem. We've had no shortage of ambition in recent years, claiming net zero by 2030, by yesterday, whatever, is just whether those targets can be reached. So when we read, um, we've been working alongside, uh, reading UNCTAD's works on a new multilateralism, restructuring the global governance. Uh, and, and this, of course, is demands that go back 40 years, but are basically coming back into, uh, into view now in the form of the global public goods, global Green New Deal. We understand that even market forces say, oh yes, of course, we agree with global public goods. So that's why we need markets so we can incentivize the provision of these goods. We disagree with that. We're, talking, we're really trying to, in, to intersect with the sort of narrative, not just coming out of UNCTAD, but the um, general secretary of the UN's report talking about global public goods should be extended to climate as well as health. And there should be other vital services that need to be part of a global public goods narrative. So we're hoping that we can take step forwards at COP26 in terms of build, solidifying an understanding around this new narrative, but also give it more programmatic content and not leave the likes of UNCTAD and Richard, who will speak shortly, on their own to develop this alternative. We need to be part of it. And that means digging deep into the details of what our alternative would look like. I'll close on saying this. The most inspiring documents of my youth when I was getting political were the visionary documents of the, the, you know, the, the socialist tradition and also documents like looking backward and the different studies that talk to what a different society would look like and could look like. It wasn't just immediate demands, however important they were. It was a vision of a different world and a different society. And that vision is needed now more than ever. So we need, but it takes hard work in order to put it together and to make people feel that there is an alternative, that we're not just complaining, but we have some plans and proposal because one day we'll be in a position to help implement them. And that's what we should be aiming to do um, in, the, in the coming years. So I'll stop there and hand it back to John. Great, thank you, Sean. Um, I'm not even going to try to add anything to that and I want us to move along quickly. Um, pleased to introduce Richard Kozel Wright, who is the Director of the Division of Globalization and Development Strategies uh, at the United Nations Conference on uh, Trade and Development, uh, UNCTAD. And uh, I know Richard is uh, going to have to leave us for another obligation, uh, but we want, are very, very pleased to have him here with us this evening. And I'll hand right over to him. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, John. Thanks to the SDUC for the invitation. Um, I mean, listening to Sean, it's, you know, our, our trajectory has a lot in common with what you said. For those that don't know, UNCTAD was set up in 1964, essentially as a voice for developing countries to reform the multilateral system inherited from uh, the, the aftermath of the Second World War, to give it a development friendly dimension. Uh, the, the, the Bretton Woods system was designed by and for advanced economies. And as more and more developing countries uh, gained their independence in the 50s and 60s, it was clear that there was a set of rules of the game at the international level that was that was obstructing their um, uh, development potential and, and their economic responsibilities to their citizens. So UNCTAD was formed to give voice to that. Our, our, our high point in the 1970s was to backstop the efforts of developing countries at the United Nations to design a new international economic order that was intended to do, to do just that, to, to particularly to address the distortions in, in international markets dominated by large northern corporations, to address the uh, challenges around the commodity-based economies and the lack of diversification that came uh, with that uh, to to make sure that the washington based institutions were were uh, handling uh, multilateral finance in a more uh, in a fairer and and more effective manner um and and uh, of course we lost that i think we lost that battle um and we lost that battle um in a in a way i think that has parallels with the uh, with the trade union movement to a neoliberal ideology and to a virulent form of uh, kind of hyper globalization in which private capital and its and its ability to to move uh, 
uh, uh, uh, unchallenged uh, 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 internationally uh, undermined the kind of countervailing power at both the national and the international level that had brought a certain degree of balance to the global economy uh, in the post-war period. Um, and, and as a consequence of that, UNCTAD moved from being an institution that was designed to think positively about changing the rules in a, in a constructive way to very much being a critic of the way in which uh, the Washington consensus and, and uh, 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 hyper-globalization was, was, was posing endless challenges for developing countries, a, a much more unstable, unequal uh, global economy in which resource mobilization had shifted towards private markets, high levels of indebtedness, uh, that had followed from that and the vulnerabilities that, that resulted from that, the inability to get out of uh, low wage, low productivity sectors and, 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 and the problems of informality that many developing countries con continue to struggle with. Uh, so we were we became critics of that. We became critics of the of the IMF and the World Bank and the and the GATT and then the WTO for perpetuating uh, and advancing uh, what we saw as a as a highly unbalanced, highly unstable um, international uh, set of rules of the game, um, and 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 in, but in a way, and and you know, I think we were proved right, of course, by the global financial crisis, which exposed all these things in a very dramatic way. Um, like like many people, we expected to see a fundamental rethink of the international uh, rules of the game, as a, given the levels of destruction and damage that, the, 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 that had been caused by the global financial crisis, and the obvious fact that this was caused by private capital. I mean, there was no way in which the state could be blamed for the global financial crisis in the way in which neoliberalism had risen on the back of a, of a, a critique of kind of intervention, uh, in, the old interventionist ideologies. Of the of the 1950s and the 1960s, but you know, private capital is far more powerful, I think, than many of many of us wish for or or, or believe. And 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 to some extent, it 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 came through the global financial crisis as strong, if not stronger than ever. Uh, in some respects, stronger than ever, its ability, for example, to strengthen the role of intellectual property rights as a source of rent seeking and profit making have in many respects intensified since the, the, global, uh, the, the global financial crisis. Um, it, interestingly, at that time, and, and, and Sean's kind of history kind of just reminded me of, of this, I, it was, I was actually in the UN in New York at the time of the Copenhagen COP. I should say, UNCTAD is not an envi environment is, and the climate is something quite new to us. I mean, we are a very traditional development organization. So, so we haven't, this is something new, but in, I, I was involved in the 2009 COP when I was in New York, I was in charge of the, the main flagship report that came out of DESA. Um, and at the time, UNEP came up with its own global green new deal. And which, which offended me, essentially, because it had nothing to do with the, I mean, you, if you use the New Deal language, you should be aware of what the original New Deal was all about. And the original New Deal was all about not only recovery, but redistribution, regulation, particularly of the financial sector, um, and, and restructuring. Uh, and and we, you, we can have an argument about how successful or not that agenda was in the United States. But if you don't have those elements as integral to your vision of a new deal, you're, you're, on, you're on, in, in other territory. And, and UNEP were essentially in the way that you described with the eventual shift to kind of inclusive green growth. Well, it was a market-based type of interpretation of the new deal. And so we offered in DESA in 2009 as part of the run-up to the COP, a kind of alternative vision of a global Green New Deal that tried to bring in these elements and particularly these elements from a development uh, uh, perspective in which uh, uh, reform of the international financial system and trading system were, were, were integral. Um, you know, again, we, we, got very, we got very little traction uh, at that time, um, partly because 
the advanced economies having kind of opened themselves up to this discourse with the re with the reverse reversion to austerity as the uh, adjustment mechanism to the imbalances caused by the global financial crisis closed off that kind of discussion in a very um, uh, 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 definitive kind of way um and and in the as, it, as i guess you all know the the the, the copenhagen cop decline uh, failed essentially because as a consequence of that there was no way in which advanced economies could meet the demands of developing countries to to support the kind of adjustments that that, 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 that they were saying everyone had to do but without the finance and the access to technology that developing countries needed to to to, to make that to make those kind of advances and I, I mean i remember present pitching this report to to ban ki moon at the time and a complete lack of interest unfortunately on the side of the un they were they were desperate to have a song for the for the copenhagen cop that seemed to be more important uh, at the time for them uh, they were not interested in the kind of systemic reforms that we were pitching as a necessary uh, uh, part of any sort of meaningful strategy to deal with the combined climate and development crises. Um, and I guess, you know, rolling forward uh, a decade, thanks in part to the, uh, the efforts of, you know, young Congresswomen in, in the United States, but civil society uh, organizers, this idea of a Green New Deal has come back. And we've tried in our work to kind of, to, to kind of put more flesh onto onto our understanding of these components around reflation, restructuring, re-regulation, re uh, redistribution um, from a development perspective. But I think a lot of that, those inequities across countries have the same roots as the inequities within countries. That is the, the rise of corporate power and, and monopolistic practices, uh, the growing financialization and the kind of both predatory and short-termist behavior that comes with that um, uh, as, as, as common sources, I think, that have posed challenges uh, within, within advanced economies as much as they have between advanced e economies and, and, and developing countries. And, and so, you know, we, the work that we've been doing, I think, has been an attempt to provide on that basis, I think for the first time in a long time, you know, a more, a more positive, Kind of agenda of the kind that I think Sean rightly said has been missing, where we're not just criticizing uh, the the uh, excesses of the hyperglobalized world, although we are doing that, uh, but also to offer uh, genuine alternatives about all different types of financing mechanisms. Much more emphasis on public investment. Much more emphasis on public finance. Uh, certainly, a strong emphasis on 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 re-regulating the, the financial system uh, the role of the developmental state as as uh, and the role of industrial policy as a critical tool of of the development state for affecting the kind of transformative agenda that that can combine development challenges with with uh, with the with the climate challenges so we've we've tried to advance i think a more kind of positive agenda around what is a, in many respects a set of old ideas but but with the recognition that that we we do all face this this common challenge uh, uh, around around the, the threat of, a, of of climate change. So so in a way, I think we've kind of converged on in many respects on where the of what, on where the trade union movement. It, it, our work is not focused on energy in per se. I have to say that um, uh, that's not the focus of the work that we do. But I think in terms of an agenda, it very much has dovetailed with 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 what you all. Uh, are doing and I think I think you know the need because of the power of organized capital in, in at this moment in time which has been not has again not been disrupted by the pan pandemic you know in the way that one would have expected given the the, 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 the problems that we face um, uh, I think the need to kind of build uh, a common narrative and alliances um, within, within and between, within and between both, you know, class-based movements and developmental, uh, intergovernmental movements. I think is back on the agenda. I think it needs a lot of work, um, but I do think there is an opportunity opening up 
around these uh, challenges that that we need to exploit in a in a in a very fundamental way if we're going to address these problems in the kind of time frame that we know um, we 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 all face. So that's in a kind of slightly rushed manner is, <laughs> is a kind of twenty year history of what of what we've been doing. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, yeah, excellent as always. And I know that, I mean, Sean, uh, Irene may correct me if I'm wrong, but I know when we reached out to UNCTAD a few months ago or several months ago, we were very excited about, you know, the possible convergence of ideas that we could see, but I think we really didn't have a sense of where it might lead. Um, optimistic, hopeful, but uh, not really clear. And I think it's been really exciting to see how the conversation has evolved and then to actually be able to convene a couple of event, events like this and carry this conversation forward with trade union, you know, allies and part of the networks that we work with has been really genuinely exciting. So look forward to where it can go from here. So um, with that, I will hand over to our next speaker, uh, Ross Foyer, who is the General Secretary of the Scottish Trades Union Congress, in whose offices we, we are pleased to meet. Um, uh, just to mention also, Sean uh, spoke briefly about the program for a public low carbon energy future that we've been working on. STUC were uh, one of the initial handful of unions to sign on to that. We were very pleased by that up to I think 17 or 18 signatory unions. I believe we've got another one today. So, uh, but STUC was out in the leadership on that as well and has done a fantastic job organizing four unions here at the COP to be participating in events like this. So I want to acknowledge that as well and the staff, uh, not just Ross, but everyone. So, and I'll hand over to Ross now. Thank you very much. Um, and just to, to say, you know, I would also like to thank all of our staff team. Uh, they've worked their socks off, uh, not only over the past uh, you know, week or so, but also in the, the months uh, running up to the COP. Um, and we, can, we really value this opportunity. You know, Scotland's a small country. Uh, we really, really value this opportunity to have this dialogue with trade unionists and progressive forces from across the world. And, you know, if the COP inside the, the steel fences achieves not a lot, I think what will have been achieved by this COP has been the level of global dialogue between trade unionists, socialists, anti-cuts campaigners, um, and climate campaigners um, and you know for me the some of the best moments of this week I think particularly it was the rat the the demo on, on Saturday although the one on Sunday was larger to see young people um, from across Scotland and beyond uh, actually calling not just for climate change but also for system change and standing in solidarity with our members who were in industrial struggle uh, and fighting for good jobs and good services. I felt that that was uh, worth its weight in gold and it gave me great faith in, in the sort of working class movements, as you say, that we absolutely do uh, have to build uh, if we're gonna uh, be able to shift the narrative and you know really deliver a uh, transformative systematic change to our economy and make no mistake these uh, these battles are absolutely linked because we will not be able to deliver any kind of just transition to net zero I don't even think we'll be able to deliver uh, the changes that need to happen full stop to meet climate change unless we have you know, really organised governmental intervention uh, to curb the, the neoliberal uh, forces of uh, private financialised capitalism, uh, the, 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 the multinationals and the corporates of this world. Uh, we really need to get a grip, uh, you know, and get our governments to get a grip of, of uh, where we are. Um, so, a lot of what's been said, I was asked to sort of respond to this. I haven't really done any preparation for this, uh, but I really was fascinated uh, uh, by, by what was said. Um, and, and it reminded me of a, a lecture that I recently delivered uh, 
for the Jimmy Reid Foundation. Jimmy Reid uh, famously was the, the leader of the, the UCS work-in, which took place 50 years ago. Um, the Upper Clyde shipbuilders, um, and uh, they really were in the vanguard of fighting back against the neoliberal attacks uh, that had started to come when people, you know, the, the Tory government of the time decided they were going to go after uh, organised labour and, and start to break down what we had built post-war, you know, what our New Deal in Britain was. And uh, I talked a lot in that lecture about how, you know, the working classes in Britain had gone through the Great Depression uh, through the 30s. Uh, my own father uh, was given away by his family because they couldn't afford to feed him. He lived in the East End of Glasgow. He was brought up by another family. There was a great sense of community in poorer communities, but there was real hardship and real poverty uh, in, in Britain and Scotland and many Western uh, countries at that time. And then we got, because of that in some ways, it plunged into fascism, the, 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 the Second World War. Uh, people sacrificed a lot. And when they came out of that, People in Britain uh, really were ready for change. They were ready to collectivise. They were ready to fight for a Labour government. Uh, and they were ready to fight for decent housing, for free education, uh, for their essential services to be run by the public sector. Uh, and so, you know, we had our power nationalised. We had our transport systems nationalised. Uh, and people had good, strong trade union organisation, they had pensions and they had reason, every reason to believe that each generation would be better off than they'd been. Uh, that, and, and over my lifetime, I'm very sad to say, and you know, sometimes I feel like I can't look my own dad in the eye at times, because I remember him telling me, when you're older, you'll all be retiring at 40, you know, there'll be automation and, and we'll make advances, but you know, it'll all get shared among the people. Um, and, and what happened in the, in, in the 1970s, the neoliberalists started to fight back and they started to take away all those things that we had fought for and we had won because they weren't handed to us on a plate. Ordinary working class people had had enough. They'd made enough sacrifices. They organised, they got together and they won these advances. And in many countries across the world, you know, we won decent social security and NHS, uh, that was free at the point of need. All of these things had to be fought for and had to be won by working class people, collectivising and fighting for them. And here we are today. And yes, we had the financial collapse of uh, you know, 2007, 2008, and still the people didn't wake up and didn't see you know, the, the lies uh, that were in front of us. Uh, but now with the COVID pandemic, I actually believe, uh, and I think also with the climate crisis, um, that people are beginning to wake up. They're beginning to realise that we need something different. Uh, that, you know, after 10 years of austerity, because what did they do? They made the poor people pay for the financial collapse. We paid for the banking crisis. Uh, and we paid for it through our public services. Uh, and we had 10 years, uh, particularly uh, across Britain, of our public services being rolled back uh, to the, the most minimal. Uh, and in Britain today, we have one of the worst safety nets in Europe in terms of our social security systems. So we have the worst statutory sick pay in Europe. So in this pandemic, poor people, poorer workers have literally had no choice but to go to work and they have died as a consequence uh, and if you look at Scotland in particular the gap between the rich and the poor is such that the two richest families in this country have the same wealth as the poorest 20 percent of our whole population that is over a million people and that is an absolute disgrace and cannot be allowed to continue and coincidentally, when you count the number of essential key workers in Scotland, the people that got us through this pandemic, because it wasn't the bosses and the billionaires that got us through this pandemic, it was the supermarket workers, the delivery drivers, the teachers, the healthcare workers, the local government workers, 
all of those different people delivering essential services that got us through this pandemic. And the frontline key workers also come to around a million people in the country of Scotland. And they are mostly on poverty pay rates and they are mostly women. And their death rate during the pandemic has been 40% higher than the rest of the population. Now, I don't know about you, but I think these are all things that are making our people angry. I've seen it happening in the way our workers have started to rise up and take industrial action and, you know, not take no for an answer in terms of their fight for decent pay and decent conditions. Now, I'm sure this must be happening where you all live as well. You all have a similar story to tell about your countries, probably worse in a lot of your countries than than our experience here in Scotland. So I think people are ready to build those working class movements. And I think it's our duty as the trade union movement to start to join those dots together and start to build that fight back. And that fight back happens in our workplaces and in our communities. There are no shortcuts to organizing, collectivizing, educating and agitating. You know, we, we have to do it street by street, workplace by workplace. But we have the ability and the power to build that big, bad, angry movement, <clears throat> shouting for change and putting pressure on our governments to make the changes that we need. And we have to do it. And, you know, that is the, the key to it, is linking those economic arguments with, with the global justice campaign. Global justice plus social justice is what's going to give us a real just transition and a real people's recovery from the pandemic. So that's our task in the period ahead. I really hope that we can continue to build the links that we have found in this COP. We can continue to share and build our evidence and our dialogue and find good examples and share our victories where we have them. You know, we, we can build locally, but we can think and join up globally and we can start to make the changes that we need to see. So I'll leave it there, but I'm really looking forward to hearing other people's experiences too, and, and your thoughts and ideas about how we build that power for change. Thank you. Excellent. Um, that's fantastic stuff. And I think Roz has given us the name for our, um, our movement next year at the COP, a big, bad, angry movement. I, I think I can already see the t-shirt and the banner. Um, so thanks for that. Um, I wanna turn next to a speaker who's coming to us from the, the ITF. Um, I think, I just wanna double check. I think there was a question about the speaking order. I wanna make sure we're good to go with David next. David Gobe, yeah, okay, good. Um, that's my understanding um, from the tech side yeah. that David should come up here to speak. Is that right? Okay, good. And then after David, we'll have Joshua Mata from the Philippines and then David Boyce with PSI. Also, I think we need to do it as consecutive. Uh, uh -huh. Also, not... Okay, to the interpreters, I think uh, we are going to need to do this in consecutive uh, interpretation as a note. Okay. If you can just give us a minute while we rearrange. Okay. Okay. Good. Merci à, à Juste avant que vous commenciez, David, vous allez être interprété en consécutif. Donc, s'il vous plaît, brève phrase et vous me donnez la parole. Vous ne partez pas sur 10 minutes, sinon ça va être compliqué. Merci. D'accord, Émilie. <rire> euh, Peut-être vous présenter euh, ITF, pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas, mais on a un long partenariat avec, avec le TUED. 
First of all, I'd like to introduce ITF. You may not know us, but we have a last longing partnership with Chuet. ITF, c'est 20 millions de travailleurs dans le monde, tout transport, tout secteur de transport confondu. Et moi, je suis le modeste représentant de la section des chemins de fer, des chemins de fer qui sont présents dans 90 pays et qui représentent modestement environ 7,5 millions de cheminots. So ITF represents 20 million workers in the transport industry uh, and around rail world. We're active. I represent rail world workers, the modest representative of uh, rail world workers. We are present in about 90 countries and with uh, 75 million. C'était quoi les 75 millions? Non, c'était 7,5 millions de cheminots. 7.5 rail world workers. Thank you. Ouais. Donc le, le, le transport, il représente euh, aujourd'hui un quart des émissions euh, de, de CO2. Et, transport euh, nowadays represents quarter of greengrass emissions. Et le transport euh, public et le chemin de fer sont des leviers essentiels pour répondre aux défis climatiques et limiter euh, la température à 1,5 degré. Public transport and railroad, particularly, are essential elements in order to limit the rise of temperature to 1.5 degrees. Donc, le rail était autrefois un, un transport du passé et se retrouve d'un seul coup être un transport du futur. So, whereas railroad used to be a transport of the past, it is now a means of transportation for the future. Alors, quelques chiffres un, un train de, de, de marchandises, il pollue 14 fois moins qu'un camion. Euh, un TGV pollue 50 fois moins qu'une voiture. Et euh, si, on, si on compare les émissions de gaz à effet de serre, les, 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 un train léger euh, pollue 57 fois moins que, que, que les voitures euh, individuelles. So if we just take a few numbers, a uh, tra um, merchandise train will um, emit 14 times less than a truck. A the TGV, a fast train, will emit 50 times less than a car, and a um, will have um, 57 uh, less percent of green grass emissions with uh, railroad transport that we do with individual autos. Alors, ces chiffres, ils sont, ils sont éloquents, mais, mais répondent à une logique de compétition entre les modes. Et euh, si, ton, si, on, si on, on voit les prévisions aujourd'hui, les transports vont augmenter de 60% en 2050. Donc, c'est un avenir qui n'est qui pas viable. Uh, these logics and these numbers uh, relate à logic of competitivity between these modes of transportation. But if we look at the uh, numbers, we also see that uh, transport will increase by 60% uh, by 2050, and therefore uh, these uh, logics are not viable. Donc, il faut donc revoir uh, notre mode de production pour réduire le transport de marchandises et le transport de, de voyageurs à ces biens fondamentaux. Et dans le même temps, il y a une concurrence entre les modes qui entraîne une baisse uh, des conditions de travail des salariés. Uh, so not only do we have to review uh, the way we produce uh, merchandise and transport merchandise, but this logic of competition between uh, transportation mode is not something that is viable on the long run. Donc il est aujourd'hui euh, vital d'avoir une réelle politique publique de transport partout dans le monde pour favoriser les chemins de fer, car c'est le, le transport aujourd'hui le moins polluant en articulant les autres modes comme des modes complémentaires pour instaurer une véritable coopération et partager les savoir-faire et les innovations. So we have to think today as a public transport as a vital element of our transport policy while well, favoring railroads since they are um, a lot less polluting, but we have to think of other means of transportation as complementary in order to uh, move forward towards uh, our uh, deals, our uh, objectives, both in terms of environment and social needs. D'ailleurs, nous soutenons euh, les, la campagne des syndicats britanniques, euh, des syndicats écossais pour euh, re-réguler euh, le transport euh, de bus et de train euh, euh, en, en Écosse et euh, avoir une, une, vraie, une vraie politique cohérente et qui réponde aux besoins euh, des Écossais. 
and we support the campaigns led by South Scottish trade unions to regulate uh, bus and um, other transports in Scotland because we need to have coherent policies in order to uh, move forward towards our objectives. Donc le train n'a pas euh, vocation à desservir tous les territoires et donc on est bien en complémentarité le train avec l'avion, le rail, euh, la route et l'aviation. Euh, le train est un mode de transport qui est différent dans plusieurs régions du monde. On a des régions euh, où le chemin de fer a été complètement détruit par les politiques libérales et les guerres. Je pense à l'Amérique latine, à certains pays d'Amérique latine, à l'Afrique ou euh, au Moyen-Orient. Um, uh, trains are not aimed at serving all territories. They have to be complementary with airline, uh, aviation, railways, and, and road transport. In certain countries, uh, the train railroad transport was completely destroyed by liberal policies and wars. This is the case for some countries in Latin America, the Middle East, and Africa. Donc chaque mode a sa place, a sa pertinence pour, pour le fret, le voyageur selon la géographie, selon la nature des marchandises. So every means of transportation is important and relevant depending on the geography and the types of merchandise that need to be transported. Les récentes décisions sur l'aviation de Paris et de Bruxelles pour limiter les, les vols à moins de 500 km quand il y a une ligne ferroviaire vont dans le bon sens. Uh, the recent decisions by Paris and Brussels to limit flights uh, when there are railroad uh, availabilities for transport of less than 500 kilometers is going in the right direction. Et donc les cheminots euh, de l'ITF vont lancer une campagne euh, pour des trains euh, sûrs et durables et euh, poser euh, quatre thématiques. Uh, so uh, ITF railroad workers will launch a campaign for safe and durable trains based on four main pillars. Alors, la première thématique, c'est la sécurité. Et euh, pour garantir la sécurité d'un transport, pour qu'il soit sûr à la fois pour les, pour les, 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 les cheminots qui vont, qui vont y travailler et les, les usagers qui vont emprunter ces trains. Et nous avons besoin de bonnes conditions de travail de ces salariés pour garantir une sécurité optimum. So the first pillar is safe uh, security, uh, safe transport and security, both for workers and for users who will use this train. And in order to have security for the users, it is essential to have good working conditions for the workers, as this is the only way to guarantee passenger safety. Promouvoir la justice sociale, parce qu'elle est, uh, uh, elle est importante aujourd'hui, elle est uh, diverse dans, dans, dans beaucoup de... de, de d'endroits du monde, il faut à la fois, euh, comment dire, euh, que les syndicats soient écoutés, entendus, euh, et que euh, l'égalité entre les hommes et les femmes soit effective. Uh, we need to promote social justice, which is essential uh, everywhere in the world. We must listen to trade unions, listen to workers' rights, and we must promote gender equality. Ensuite, deux, deux dernières thématiques qui, sont, qui nous semblent nous liées, c'est à la fois euh, euh, les enjeux de durabilité, donc répondre aux, aux enjeux climatiques et euh, se ré, réapproprier publiquement le chemin de fer. On pense que, on, on pense que le, le, pour répondre aux enjeux économiques, sociaux et environnementaux, euh, nous avons besoin d'un chemin de fer public et sous contrôle public. Um, there are two more issues which we think are essential. The first is the matter of sustainability, climate challenges, and the second aspect is that of public ownership. Uh, in order to respond to economical, social, and environmental challenges, we need to have public ownership and public control of uh, transport. Pensons que le service public est le fait qu'un secteur appartient à sa nation. When we think of public services, it is not just that a sector must belong to its nation. Et que c'est la richesse de ceux qui n'ont rien. It is the wealth of those who have nothing. Et euh, ça répond aux besoins et on répond aux besoins euh, et on contribue selon ses moyens. C'est ça la véritable philosophie du, du service public. The true philosophy of public service is to respond to the needs of those who, have, who do not have anything. 
Alors, le transport, le logement, l'énergie, l'éducation, la santé, ce sont des besoins fondamentaux. Tout. Et l'énergie de nos trains doit dépendre d'une entreprise publique euh, déconnectée du marché, parce qu'il n'est plus possible de spéculer sur euh, ces biens fondamentaux. Health, education, housing, transport, all of these elements must depend on public policies. Our transport must depend on public policies. We, can, uh, we uh, cannot just rely on deregulated market logics for these uh, uh, goods and services. Et donc, dans cette, euh, dans cette campagne que, que lancent euh, lance les cheminots et l'ITF, nous avons 27 revendications sur ces quatre thématiques. Et bien sûr, elles sont... Euh, nous avons euh, des revendications claires pour, être en, pour mettre en cohérence le service public ferroviaire avec le service public de l'énergie. And with the, within this campaign that is launched by ITF Railroad Workers, we have 27 demands based on these four pillars, clear demands that demand a coherence between a public uh, transport policy and a public energy policy. Voilà, je vais m'arrêter là. Je, je sais que l'interprétation comme ça... Hein qui n'est pas simultané, ce n'est pas évident. Donc, merci à toutes de vos, votre écoute et de votre attention. I will stop here, recognizing that interpretation done consecutively is not always easy. And I would thank you all for listening and for your kind attention. Thanks very much, David. I think I neglected in the confusion about the logistics to introduce David properly. He's the chair of the ITF Railway Workers Section and director of the International Center of the CGT Railway, Railway Workers Federation. I hope I got that all correct. All right, great. And with that, I will then uh, invite Joshua Mata to, to come and speak. Uh, yeah, if you could join us here. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, Joshua is the General Secretary of Centro in the Philippines. Thanks, John. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, at the onset, let me let me start by saying that we are one with the trade unions for energy democracy and all the unions in the room. That um, that indeed uh, corporations can't deliver the energy transition that we all badly need today. So that's the first point. But having said that. The alternative narrative of energy being part of the public global goods no, um, that's based on an alternative economic structure where public ownership and democratic control uh, plays a crucial role, unfortunately has yet to play, um, uh, has yet to gain uh, uh, traction among the general public in the Philippines. That's the problem. No? Um, and this, and, and, and this is, um, Ironically enough, this is despite the fact that the privatization, for example, the privatization of, um, of electric power in the Philippines, which uh, is now on its second decade this year, has miserably failed in all aspects you know, of, of the premises of the privatization in the first place. I mean, first they said it will lower electricity costs. It did not. No, it, we still have the world's, the world's uh, most, uh, most expensive, one of the world's most expensive power uh, rates. Weights were consistently on the top three most expensive uh, rates in Asia. Can you imagine that? No? So we have, we have a third world economy, but a first world price of electricity. <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of problem we're facing. No? It, has, it has also, uh, even during the pandemic in the COVID, uh, in this pandemic, it has also uh, showed that uh, it, we, we see, we saw that, that, the, uh, that uh, privatized energy cannot actually cope with the actual needs of the people unless the state steps in. You know, um, and uh, can you imagine millions lost their jobs because of the world's, because we've had the world's longest and harshest lockdowns uh, ever. Uh, and, and, and because many people lost their jobs, many people cannot pay their electricity. So can you imagine a privatized company being able to afford to provide electricity without actually getting paid for it? It, it was done simply because the government stepped in. You know? uh, so the private sector, the, a privatized energy system really cannot deal with the kind of pandemic that we have. So, so that's the irony. Now, despite all these failures, 
we still have to gain traction for for uh, the kind of alternative old public ownership uh, that that we're thinking that we're imagining. And and and, and let me give you just a quick context first. No, um, we still have we still have two hundred. Oh, sorry, two point thirty six million households in the Philippines who are not connected uh, to the power grid. Uh, that's incredible problem. No. Uh, and approximately, while approximately half of the uh, of those in the rural uh, rural areas, particularly in the Philippines, are provided electricity primarily through the electric cooperatives, the problem now is that the government, after spending billions of pesos in developing electric cooperatives in the country since the 1970s, now wants to privatize it. They now want to. They now want the, the the corporations to take it over. No, and 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 actually, that's one of the biggest fights that we have had ever since we 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 joined the 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 trade the two uh, the, the the trade unions for energy democracy. I, you know, uh, when I was first invited by by the two um, one of the one of my favorite stories was the the massive struggle that we've had in fighting privatization in one province called Albay. Where we had a three-year strike, that's right, three years, no, of a, of a strike, and and, uh, and 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 it was it was fantastic strike in a sense because uh, we kept copying from our, our our South African comrades. We actually announced uh, we actually announced to the public that they should not pay their electricity, and come on, who who in the room? Would not agree to such a campaign. Don't pay your electricity bill. Everyone agreed, you know. So, and and, and so what the company did is that they would cut off the electricity of, of all those communities. So the union on strike set up this flying squad, which then goes to the community and links it up, providing them with what we call unlimited electricity. <laughs> hey, that, Hang on, man. That's that's not an, that wasn't an original idea. That we we actually copied that idea from the South African comrades, you know, who did it. You know? so it was a very successful campaign, but we still lost it. At the end of the day, after three years, the the workers were just paid, you know, higher amount, of course, but we still lost the industrial fight. But we won a massive political victory. Since then, no company in the Philippines would like to take over any electric cooperative in the same way again. So that's a victory, you know, that's a victory. But oh, thank you, thank you. But that, the story doesn't end there. <laughs> the problem is our enemies are much more, much more cunning than, than, than we are, you know, in most cases. No? Uh, now, because they have failed, they cannot do the same uh, thing. What they're trying to do now is to come up with legislation that will practically steal the franchises of electric cooperatives and give it to power to, to privatized companies. And this morning, and this morning, I just got the report that uh, the the Senate uh, uh, Senate Committee on Franchising is actually thinking of coming up with a committee report that will actually do so. So you know, that means when I go back into the Philippines, we have a massive campaign to run again. No? So, but but uh, having said that, and I know I'm I'm taking too much time, but just just to mention that, why is it so important for us to, to keep this uh, uh, electricity, for example, or even other public services, as much as possible, the electric cooperatives, why is it important for us to defend it against corporatization? Well, because experience has shown, after 20 years, experience has shown that private, uh, privatization of public energy will never work. You know, and so all of those out there who believe who whose government are saying that, you know, uh, a, a privatized a, a privatized public service is better than, um, uh, the, you know, inefficient ones that we have today. Well, that's not true. We have seen we we have seen in the Philippines that privatized companies can be as as inefficient, if not more inefficient, than publicly held uh, ones. No, before um, second. Um, we, it's important for us to keep them public because we know for a fact that they will never transition, pri a private company will never transition to renewable energy. And this is, a, this is, this is one important point. You know, uh, we're a tropical country, so we have a lot of a potential for solar, we have some potential, a lot of potential for wind and even mini hydro. 
And many of the private companies in the Philippines have, have applied for franchises to develop such, such uh, you know, um, renewable energy resources. But you know what? After many, many years, even if they were granted these applications, they've actually never done it. Why? Because it's because all, all of the companies that's operating in the Philippines are actually have actually built their own coal plants, and that's the reason why they wanted, and that's the ones they wanted to sell. You know, so a privatized company is not going to do the, the energy transition that we need. At least that's our experience. And and so so the problem is. But the problem is, as I said, it's business as usual still in the Philippines. Why? And here, this is something that I've been reflecting. Uh, you know, this is something that I've reflected on while you were here talking. No? And I think one of the biggest problem is that because the movement itself is also in a crisis. No? That's the problem. No? Um, I've always believed I'm a socialist. I've always believed that socialism is far more superior than whatever capitalism can come up with, whatever patriarchy can come up with. But our problem has always been this. We have yet to develop a pragmatic, you know, a program that's, that, 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 that people can actually latch onto to help realize what socialism actually means. No? Um, so, and so that's the first problem, the vision, the alternative. Sec that, that people can buy, that, that can people can, can, that, that can spark the imagination of the people. And the second is that I, well, in the Philippines in particular, we still help to build the kind of power, organized power that will actually sustain such a campaign. So that's the challenge now. The challenge for us, and I'm about to wrap up here. The challenge is one, uh, we need to keep electric cooperatives, for example, in the Philippines uh, under public hands. And, and, and to do that, make them much, much more efficient by just convincing them, by helping them to actually transition, to generate their own renewable energy resources. No? How do you do that? Well, we have to get the government active in this. They have the money to do this. The government has, uh, we've seen it. Now, for the first time in the lives of many Filipinos, uh, at the time when we were all jobless, the government coughed off money. So it, it, you know, it just proves that if the government wants, they can do this. And they've been spending trillions, trillions of pesos to, to do this their program called Build, 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 which is exactly, essentially a massive infrastructure program. If they can come up with such a money, a, a huge amount of money for that, well, why can't they do it in order to save the world, right? So there is the money. The problem is there's no political will to do it. And if they keep on saying, no, we really don't have money because it's all allocated for, you know, to someone else. Well, we can always tell them, well, why don't we tax, why don't we tax the rich? Right? Let's just tax the rich. You know, this pandemic, in this pandemic, you know, the billionaires in the Philippines, they actually increased their wealth by 30% at a time when millions of Filipino workers actually went hungry and jobless. So let's tax those Ganda bitches, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, 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 let the, and let them pay for the renewable, for, let them pay for the, for the alternative world that we want. Now, so, so uh, but the biggest challenge is, how do we build the movement that will actually sustain this? That's the biggest challenge for us in the Philippines. Why? Because we're facing multiple crises. We're facing a health crisis still. We're facing, we're facing, uh, we're facing uh, uh, an economic crisis the likes of which we have never seen since World War II. We're facing a massive jobs crisis that we have never seen for the past two decades. We're facing a massive human rights crisis where about 20,000 to 30,000 people actually lost their lives because of the so-called war on drugs, which is essentially war on the poor, launched by this crazy bastard called Mr. Duterte. But the biggest challenge, you know what's the biggest challenge for me? You know, we are actually facing a potential disaster next year in our national elections, where the son of the Marcos of Marcos uh, uh, dictatorship, you know, aptly named Ferdinand Marcos Jr. <laughs> could end up either being the president or the vice president of the country. And that's going to be absolute shame you know, if we allow it to happen. So amidst all these challenges, the key question for us is how do we build the power so that we can actually sustain the kind of alternative that we all need? What's my answer? I have no clue. And if you have an answer, please text me and I will follow it. What I only know is that, hey, I'm a sucker for lost causes. 
So let's just do it, do the best that we can, and you know, everything else will follow. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Joshua. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Joshua. We're going to prove you wrong. <laughs> no, I like I like how the energy is building around this, and I think this may shift from being a discussion to being the launch of the big bad angry movement. <laughs> so, right. Uh, thanks, Joshua. Great stuff. Um, with that, I will introduce our final. Uh, panelist for this evening, not the final speaker, because I'm sure we'll hear from others as well. Uh, David Boyce, who is the Deputy General Secretary of Public Services International and a uh, longtime uh, hanger on of Chewed and supporter and provoker and ally and uh, an all around invaluable part of the network. So David. Thank you, John. Um, Roz, I have bad news, really bad news. The COP is going to be extended. Have you heard that? <laughs> I've heard. I'm reading the the in, the insider of the of the trade unions inside COP. It will not finish when it's supposed to finish. They won't get the deals done. So your city will continue to be invaded by. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. For yeah, yeah. No, um, and and Roz, I think I've said it in another meeting, but. Um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Philip Alston, uh, he's from Australia, but he's a very, very capable guy. And he's at New York University now, isn't he? Anyway, his 29, 2019 report on poverty in the UK basically said that it was due to political choices. It's not some you know, major problem that you have in your economy that you, you know, or that everybody's in the pub all the time. No, it's political choices. And when he goes through it, and I recommend the reading of it because this was presented to the UN General Assembly. It's not as if uh, these crises that we're addressing here uh, are unknown by the, the UN system and, and the various agencies. Um, but I, rec I recommend reading it, even though you know it because you've lived it and you, you were quite, uh, quite specific on, on certain examples. But hearing how he did his visit as an outsider and a, with a, a special uh, mandate on uh, human rights puts it in, in really fascinating. It's not a, a trade union document. It's a UN document, but it, it's, pretty, it's pretty crazy. And as, as Joshua said, we've got all these interconnected crises. And what I've been uh, talking about is the, the two bookends of COVID and climate, but there, there's just so many other linkages uh, inside those that, that we have to fight as a labor movement, uh, as uh, community leaders, as responsible members of, uh, of uh, our various organizations. And, so for me, it's clear that what we need, and, and Joshua, I am not an advocate of lost causes. I like to turn my causes into winning causes. Thank you very much. Um, but I will admit, we haven't been able to reverse the privatizations in the Philippines. And it, it, it is, uh, it's gotta be a fascinating country because there's tons of great progressives like Joshua, but the system has a stranglehold uh, can I click it to my? Uh, maybe not. Uh, this, it, it appears the Philippine system has a stranglehold uh, on uh, on inequality and and uh, and privatization. But for me, it's about more in-country education. We've got to do more education of our members. There, there's no option. We've got to spend the time and the effort to meet. Uh, in the workplaces or wherever it is that you your union organizes to talk to them. But also because for PSI, our members are integral parts of the community because we deliver the public services that we all depend on, that you depend on, that, and that we, a lot of us, take for granted. Um, and so for us, the I think between COVID and climate, we have a unique moment and Roz, you, you touched on it with the, the 
the Fridays for Future stri uh, strikers um, being with us, but we have a unique moment to connect our work in the community that we haven't had for quite some time. Uh, and, and I suspect it's been uh, in my whole lifetime that I, that I haven't uh, seen the set of circumstances which are pretty negative. But in PSI, we understand that our terms and conditions are decided by political processes. And so basically we understand that we have to be political in order to influence the terms and conditions of our members. But what appear to be local or national political processes and decisions are actually often connected to global political processes. And this is where we often don't make the connection appropriately in the labor movement and even in PSI. So the labor movement if they see, let's take uh, any name of an auto manufacturer, let's take uh, Volkswagen. They have plants in 30 countries. So the German union, IG Metall, that organizes in Volkswagen will understand that they have to go in all those 30 countries and organize the workers and together put pressure on this global corporation. That's, that's fairly straightforward. Um, it's not easy to do. But what we don't understand is that the decisions that are being made by your local council or your national government are actually the result of processes decided in Washington, in Paris, in London, in Tokyo, in the major power centers of the planet. And so that's where we have to be able to with our members, with the education, connect their daily work in their, uh, in their school, in their hospital, in their retirement home to global processes. Now, one of the easiest ways to do that is when they get privatized by BlackRock, one of the private equity firms, then they know things are global because uh, BlackRock will totally screw up the working environment. But for us, our, we've got to focus on the, the policies that so I don't assume that Scotland has a seat on the World Bank yet. No, but London does. Whitehall nominates somebody to the World Bank. Uh, Washington nominates somebody to the World Bank from their government. And they sit there and make decisions that influence uh, the life of Joshua's members or uh, you know what, what's going on uh, across the world. And so... Part of this fight that we've got to do has got to be about figuring out how to inform, educate, train our members about the global system. It's really, really fundamental. Look, the, the last big mobilization that I remember was Seattle against the WTO and Genoa against the G8. And those were massive mobilizations. And guess what? They shocked the system to the core. But then came 9-11. And all of that changed. And all of a sudden, any progressive movement was basically branded, well, a terrorist organization or some form of you know, illegitimate resistance. Um, the 2008 financial meltdown was, I think, a huge lost opportunity for progressives to re-regulate the financial system and the private financial uh, corporations, which have only grown in strength. And I think looking back, a lot of us are kicking ourselves for that because again, you should never waste a good crisis to make the change you need. And nothing changed in the financial system and private equity is, uh, is stronger than ever. Um, but also I would say that our challenge in TUED, we have got now a 150 page report out of which we've distilled uh, six paragraphs of bullet points. We need now to distill that into training and, uh, and advocacy toolkits because it's not everybody who pays attention to where their energy comes from. They, they don't pay attention to whether the lights are on or not. They don't pay attention to why we've got, uh, we can charge all these, uh, all these tools for working. And so for me, this has got to be 
uh, a big step where we're going to lean on a number of unions to help us um, because it is one of the key areas that powers all of modern civilization. And as I've said before in another meeting, when I or help unions organize fights uh, uh, against privatization, and possibly our most successful is in the water sector. Um, and yes, governments get very worried when we mobilize the community, and especially when we mobilize uh, women's groups, because in many countries, they're the ones who are responsible for getting and using water. And they know that if they have um, if they have contaminated water, then they might be, you know, killing their kids, which happens, I think, every five seconds, a kid dies because of contaminated water. It's some horrible statistic. But when we start the fight against energy privatization, the army moves in, the military comes and takes over the union, takes over the production facilities, and puts the, the union leaders in jail. So that's just to show you the different impact, even though we can live without electricity longer than water, electricity is seen as the most fundamental strategic uh, sector for most governments. And so for me, the, the, the work that we're doing on, uh, with TUED uh, against the, the private promises of innovative finance, where we're going to de-risk, use taxpayer money to de-risk uh, the, the corporate uh, investments, Look, it's, it's not just theoretical. It's not working. It hasn't worked. They've been using this for 10 years. The money is not moving where it's needed. We need a different model. And our different model is going to only come about when we do the education, when we do the discussions about why we have to change. Climate is clear, but it's not just climate. It's, it's also social justice. It's gender equity. Uh, it's inequality, it's a whole range of these issues are encapsulated in probably each one of our sectors of public services. In, in healthcare, why, are, why is a, a heavily female dominated sector so underpaid and under-resourced? In, in water, why, why is such a, a, a key uh, source of life being uh, targeted not only by the, the private water management, but also by all the drinks companies um, and energy. So for me, uh, we've got to together figure out how to turn the work that we've been doing in TUED for nigh on 10 years and in PSI prior to that for another 10 years um, into real mobilization and action. And so on that note, I'm gonna encourage everybody to plug in to our energy campaign, not plug into your wall, but plug in to the global energy campaign. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, David. Um, we are going to try to open things up now for some contributions from the floor, either here in person uh, at the STUC headquarters or uh, people who are participating online. Uh, we've heard a pretty rich set of contributions, I think, laying out a range of challenges that I'm sure we all know to some degree that we face, but I think it's good to have them kind of laid out before us again and, and, and summarized. There's some, you know, very serious challenges in education, um, whether it be about the functioning of the global system, the financial system, um, the political system, or more technically uh, within TUED, we talk ab about the need for a sort of higher level of technical literacy across the union movement about, about energy systems in particular, but the electricity systems, the power systems in particular, which do have some very unique and very challenging um, technical characteristics that we really need to grapple with in order to, to, to have the informed political discussion that we need to have about what, what options there are and what we should be pursuing uh, as, as solutions to keeping the lights on as we decarbonize our economies. And obviously this intersects with the, the struggles around transport and healthcare and so forth. We talk about how, you know, we're all energy unions now because emissions are obviously affecting everyone and, and, and things like transportation are, you know, in, vital to all kinds of working people, whatever sector you're in to, to get to work and to have that be affordable and then not be destroying the climate 
is obviously a fundamental uh, interest of, of all working people. So I'm hoping that some of the contributions might be able to begin to move forward our thinking around you know, concrete ways that we can approach uh, meeting some of these challenges that, that have been laid out. So now that I've told you what you can speak about, um, I, I wanna open it up for, for any contributions. I, don't, I haven't seen hands yet. I hope someone else might be, uh-huh. Yeah, so we can have people raise hands in person. I see someone here. Um, if you are online, you can use the raise hand function under reactions. And I will try to keep a stack uh, that, that is uh, taken from both groups and I'll try to keep that in order. So I see a hand here first, and, but a technical question. Do people need to come and speak from the front if they're in the room? Yeah? Uh huh. great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, uh, David, David, um, and others for the for the contributions um, and the non Davids. Um, <laughs> um, I have um, I have a question that I mean I I think Richard um, was really spot on when he you know said that if you're serious about talking about the Green New Deal, you have to talk about redistribution regulation. Um, I know, Sean, in your remarks, you know, you sort of mentioned carbon pricing. I think that was probably the only mention during um, during this whole event, but I think it's really central. I think we've been critiquing carbon pricing for a long time as a trading movement and, and, and generally as a, as a left progressive movement. And I think that's really important, but I'm wondering what we can add and what any of the panelists or, or anyone who's spoken thinks about this. Um, on the flip side, you know, we have a we have a sort of a critique of carbon pricing, but what's our what's our alternative? And in a way, you know, to me, there's this sort of two classical and putting in the language of kind of economics. You can either ration by price, which is carbon pricing, or ration by quantity, which is what we used to do. You know, during the war, for example, during wartime, we used to have cards for 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 everything. How how can we make some of these? I think positive arguments for rationing by quantity, whether it's energy, for example, you know, what, what different uses it goes to and how we sort of regulate and redistribute and how I think as a trade union movement, can we make those arguments without falling into a sort of climate austerity and rationing as a kind of, you know, bringing down of, of living standards, um, but as a way of sort of redistribution and combining some of that technical kind of education with real political arguments about how we need to sort of you know divide up goods and really which I think is you know it's just a way after so much so much neoliberalism and a sort of victory of, of that ideology we're just not used to thinking in those terms and I think it's a hard argument to make so I'm just sort of curious about any ideas and thoughts okay can you just introduce yourself as well as you oh sure so uh, so I'm Michal Rozorski I'm a member of Unite but I, um, I I work for the International Transport Workers Federation as a researcher Thanks. Let me just say one, one quick comment is energy rationing is happening all over, uh, all over the world. Uh, it's called either load shedding, brownouts or blackouts. So it is happening. Uh, it depends on what the system can handle. Uh, but in, in general, there is going to have to be a notion, especially in the rich countries that we need to do with less. That is, that's not a, a message we wanna hear. Nobody wants to hear that, but guess what? We are gonna have to do it less and, uh, and we'll have to do it better. But anyways, I, I'm gonna leave the real tech answer to Sean about carbon pricing or John. <laughs> Should we take a couple more questions? Because yep. get, get me on the Yeah, no, that, that, I, was gonna, I was gonna suggest we maybe take questions in threes. And I see a hand here in the room. I don't see anything in the chat yet or in the, the hand raise. Um, hi, I'm Clara Paylard. I used to be PCS and I'm now Unite Community. I speak to the microphone. Um, I've just been spending the last few days surrounded by a lot of young people from Fridays for Future, people from MAPA countries, which are the most affected people in areas, women, and a wide range of you know, representation of this planet. And it seems to me that a lot of people are talking about how they haven't got access to um, those public services and to like proper energy already. They live in country where they're like, 
repress and oppressed and I'm just like trying to think about how we can even imagine that those public services are going to be funded in this situation. I sort of like lost some of my optimism at the moment. Uh, of course, people's movement is the only thing that can change things. But what I hear a lot of those voices is to talk about loss and damage, loss and damage that is already happening. People are losing their houses, their schools, their hospitals, their infrastructures. There may be like some energy production system that are getting lost to climate events. Um, so they're talking about uh, reparation and like some international funding that wouldn't be about development, but about more like some climate justice. So I was wondering what you think of that, how does that fit into your thinking and how we can like take this dialogue out to those communities, indigenous people, uh, women on the ground who may not be unionized and you know what we can do to make that real difference and those real links. Thanks. Great, thank you, Clara. Good to see you as well. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see any other hands, and I want to see then if Roz would. So oh, is there? Oh, I'm sorry, that's you. your. It's behind. <laughs> Couldn't see the hand. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name's Floyd, and um, I sorry, and um, I am a member of uh, so of uh, PCS, so one of the super service unions here in London, but. I'm also um, I'm sure a student and I'm with the Birkbeck uh, Climate Climate Network. And um, it's just in response to something that um, David said to my um, left, because when he said, you know, that we have to start talking effectively about rationing or indeed, you know, about, um, about um, austerity, um, he said it's something that is unpalatable. And I think that's why in terms of it is unpalatable. It's something that we shouldn't actually be contemplating because it presupposes then that the resources aren't there. No, sorry, it, it, sorry. it presupposes that the resources are finite and that therefore, uh, and that therefore we all have to share an equal bit of the burden. But working class certainly in the UK has actually been paying to the nose. I mean, you know, um, it's been, it's, I mean, to be momentarily crude, crude uh, it's been screwed so hard it might as well be on Tinder. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, um, it has been hit that hard. And if we are going to get a working class buy-in to fighting climate change and indeed for social justice, mm. I don't think we can go forward by telling them that social justice is um, allied with climate change means that you have to do with less. Because um, I can imagine, but don't want to go to a single mum on one of the more crappy estates in the Gorbals and telling her, that she has to cut her carbon footprint. I can just imagine her response back to me, which wouldn't be printable here. So, you know, so I think, you know, that we have to, um, you know, um, we, you know, um, we have to think bigger. Um, our demands are modest. We only want the world. Yeah. Very good. Yes. Please. I know this. I know that the austerity question is is a huge one. It looms very, very large, and I, I think needs to be given some serious attention. Ultimately, the question I suppose is who's responsible to cut working people's carbon footprint? Is it they themselves, or is there another approach? Yeah, I want to talk. About, yes, my name is is John Sinner. I'm from uh, London, and I'm involved with the campaign against climate change trade union group. One thing I want to talk about is. Since the Second World War, one of the biggest planning disasters is the way that the car has been promoted over public transport. We can see this everywhere. We can see it in this city where you've got urban motorways, you know, motorway cutting through the centre of Glasgow, something that really shocks me every time I walk across Kelvin Bridge. And we have this, this problem is rep reproducing itself. In America, you've got car dependent, and North America, it's even worse with car dependent suburbs, which are now falling apart because there's no money to maintain the roads anymore, um, which is very interesting. Um, and in London, where I live, um, you know, the mayor, I mean, our mayor is, is pretty rubbish most of the time, uh, but sometimes he half-heartedly has, you know, there's been this plan to 
encourage, uh, you know, a modal shift to using bikes, walking, public transport. But it's, it's uh, and we've had this big fight over low traffic neighborhoods, uh, you know, and this false uh, war, that culture war that's being created by the right, by the fossil fuel lobby against modal shift, against car dependency. And I think the trade unions need to work more closely with local communities and say, no, we don't want to have a car dependent city. And when we have these camp, you know, these astroturfing campaigns that we're having in London and boroughs like Ealing and Harrow, where they've got rid of their LTNs because of the pressure from the car lobby, we need to say no. And sometimes it's Labour councils that are doing it. They're actually scrapping the LTNs because of the the pressure they're getting from these astroturfing campaigns from the car industry, from the oil industry. And I think workers in also live, they don't just work, they also live in those communities. They need to get involved in these campaigns and say, no, we want to have car-free cities. Uh, because if we don't, so if we can't decarbonize transport in urban areas, and which is supposed to be the easiest thing to do, if we can't even get that done, we've got no hope of actually reversing, raising emissions. LTN. LTN, low traffic neighborhoods. Thank you. The and other cities in we have an international audience here. Don't, we don't know all the acronyms, so just very Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I do see one more hand. Aspir and I had said we would do qu uh, questions in threes. I know we've gone beyond that, but I see just one more. So I want to take that and then we'll come back to the panelists to get some responses, if that's all right. No objections. Good. Aspir, online, if you can unmute yourself. And if the tech people can wave whichever wands they need to wave. Great. Here we are. Okay, just a quick one. Uh, thank you for excellent meeting, excellent discussions and contributions. Uh, it's, it's great to hear that people are sort of now discussing how to get to the next level of struggle. But that is, the, that is the important thing that we are faced with. Uh, the, the first level, in a way, in the level of slogans, as uh, Sean mentioned in his introduction, that is not very helpful. So we have to go up to, to the next level, which is a programmatic uh, level to come up with concrete proposal on what to do. And Mike, question, though my, my, my challenge to you is that why don't we also at the same time think about taking the, the third step, which is not slogans, which is not programmatic statement because we have them, but is the question of to mobilize power, social power in order to fight through these demands that we have, because I think that is one of the big problems that we have in the trade union movement in, in most of the world, not least in, 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 in the northern countries, in, in Europe and, and, and US and so on. So to mobilize power is, is important. And we have to do, and we have to learn from the history when we are going to do that. Because the trade union leaders are referring to social dialogue, tripartite cooperation, a seat at the table, all these kind of things. But they have to remember how that became a reality. It became a reality because the trade unions were able to, to fight. They were able to, to, they represented a threat against the economic interests of the capitalist, capital owners. And that, that's the way to, to get power in order to change realities in society. So uh, I think there's, the, the discussion we have is now turning in the right direction. And I, I, I like very much the, the, the leader of, of STUC uh, contribution. Uh, also then when she said that people are ready, people are ready. Okay, go for it, go for it.
Great. Well, I'm going to give Roz a chance to come back now. We'll turn to the panelists for some quick responses. We have about 10 minutes left. I think we may end up going a few minutes over if that's okay, but we'll, not too much. I'm told we, we have to leave. Okay. I'll, I'll come in. Yeah. I'll come through this as, as quickly as I possibly can. First, to as Bjorn, uh, I, I actually agree this will take leadership at every level within our trade union movement uh, and now the really hard work begins. Uh, there is no shortcut to organising. Um, we need our leaders to actually put tremendous amount of resources into first of all actually employing and training more organisers. Organising is a skill, it is a craft, whether you be an industrial organiser or a community organiser. And I'm actually tremendously excited by some of the new generation of trade union leaders that have recently been elected. Uh, people like Sharon Graham at Unite, people like Gary Smith at GMB. These people understand uh, the power of organising and the power of fighting back. If you fight back, you might not always win, but you will surely lose if you don't fight back. And we need to gain that more militant edge back in our trade unionism, uh, because we've done the social dialogue. Uh, and we've, you know, up here in Scotland, we get a seat at every table. Um, <laughs> but they don't listen to us. So we need to actually build the power to make them listen. And that is only going to come through as David said, actually education, and we were just talking earlier as colleagues about how do we run a serious programme now in our communities in Scotland of political education. We produced the manifesto for a, a people's recovery late last year. It is an economic uh, argument for, for, you know, absolutely transformative change in our economy and the things we need to do to give working class people a better share of the income, wealth and power that this country has, but it doesn't share fairly. So we need to get that education and agitation going. And I have faith, actually, that, that, that we have some leaders now in some pretty serious places and a shop stewards movement uh, there that, that, that wants to see that sort of leadership. Um, I, I, I couldn't agree more with, with the sister... Uh, over here, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name, but the, the points that you made uh, around the, the the issues in the Global South and the, and the need for restoration and reparation uh, for loss and damage that is already occurring. You know, we are already in this uh, crisis. There are things that we can't turn back. The damage has already been done in, in a lot of cases. People's lives are, are being affected. And I, I really think that it is that link, you know, it's the same solution we do uh, until we actually manage to turn around, you know, and get more people educated to vote differently uh, and vote in national governments that are prepared to take uh, a more socialist approach uh, to how we run our countries that are prepared to take our energy and our key public services back into public control. Uh, in the global north, we're not going to solve that problem of the global south because if they can't even share the, the wealth of their country with their own people, how are we going to get them to share it with the people of the world? Uh, so if we want a fairer world where the wealth and power is distributed more evenly, we're going to have to work for it and organise, and, and that goes in every country. Um, and again, there are no shortcuts to this. I, this is not going to be easy. We don't call it a struggle for nothing, uh, <laughs> but it's... It's got to be done, if you know, and it is absolutely integral to that fight for for solving the the climate crisis. Um, and I think that the 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 comrade is right about our energy systems being an absolute collapse. Uh, we've got electricity and gas bills that are now going through the roof here in Britain. We've got companies collapsing. I sat in a meeting with the Scottish government just recently, where the heads of all the big energy companies. We're moaning and groaning about how they'll have to be more done by the government to support them because they're having to take on all these unprofitable contracts that because all the other companies are folding. And, uh, you know, I was the lone voice in the room saying, well, you've all made the perfect argument for why your market is broken. Now, can we please renationalise our energy systems <laughs> and, uh, you know, get on with actually solving this problem uh, for good? I can't 
be the only voice in the room. We have to change that. We actually need to elect the government ministers to agree with that argument. And that can only be done through the ballot box and through a long, hard democratic struggle. Um, you know, people in the garbles are, are, are paying for their, their electricity through the nose, a uh, higher rate than, than the people who are paying direct debit up the road in Bearsden, uh, because they're paying in coin operated, uh, mm. you know, meters in some cases. So that whole rationing thing, nobody knows like a poor person in Scotland. We've yeah. got some of the highest fuel poverty in Europe uh, about rationing electricity more. The problem is we need the people who are, you know, using 10 times, a uh, hundred times that amount to start rationing. And I think, you know, there is room for rationing, just like there's room for a maximum wage. Let's stop talking about minimum wages. I want to see this country implement maximum wages so that we can redistribute. And that's why uh, you got spontane spontaneous applause from me whenever anyone says the three words tax the rich. I mean, <laughs> if we can just get our heads around how to do that. And I don't mean tax the people who are earning you know, 60,000 instead of 30,000 or 20,000. I mean, tax the billionaires and the corporate giants eh, because it's obscene, it's absolutely obscene, the money that we are allowing these global corporations to continue to make. Eh, and, and we have to stand up and stand together. So we need to be saying we've had austerity, we've had privatisation, they had their chance to prove to us that that was a shiny new way forward, and they failed us. The neoliberals failed us. They failed all of the people of the world, and we're not doing it anymore, and we want a better and a fairer system going forward. Thank you. I don't need to unmute, right? Uh, it's very hard to follow that, so I'll, I'll keep my comments brief. I, you know, I was asked to address this issue of energy use and the role of carbon prices, which said there's a bit of a damp squib at the end of, a, of this evening, but I think we can agitate a little bit around that as well. I mean, first of all, there's too much emphasis on individuals, and there's too much emphasis on residential use, which is a minority of energy use in every country in the world. Some countries, it's as low as 10 or 15%. In, even in the developed world, it's never much more than 30%. So we talk about houses and people, what you should do in your homes. What about the big industrial users? What about the big shopping malls? What about the big skyscrapers who keep their lights on all night and the lead lighting systems? We've got to have definitely a regulatory approach that basically says, if you do not comply with reasonable efforts, they can be progressive in terms of how um, how, um, how they need to be enforced over time. We can start somewhere and in five years, it could be in a different place. But if you don't comply, you don't get electricity. And that's what public energy can do. And we can say that, and before they say, well, we're going out of business because we can't, we're gonna go, we just say, well, we will, the workers and the community will take over this production facility or whatever the facility may be. And that could be a temporary measure to bring the bosses back to the table, or frankly, it could be a permanent measure. Why not? Why can't workers run, you know, Primark? <laughs> I mean, it raises questions about where they would get the products from, but that's a, that's a fight that we have to wage at the, globe, at the global scale. But what we do know about carbon pricing and why it's been a complete failure, it's first of all, it hasn't been introduced. Now, one of the things about the trade union critique is it rarely mentions, at least at the top level, the fact that something like 85% of emissions do not have a price globally. And that the emissions that is priced is so low, it has no effect on investment or consumption. So this is fundamental. The other thing that needs to be raised is this issue of subsidies, fossil fuel subsidies. And you know, you read headlines that is five trillion, and you think, well, five trillion annually in subsidies to fossil fuel industries. Well, then why do we don't need public ownership? We just need to stop the subsidies. But if you look at what the IMF is calling a subsidy, it's in their interest to avoid the question of ownership, because that's what's needed, and point to the problem of subsidies. 96% of the subsidies is the unpriced carbon. They put a value on the carbon. Then they say, if it was priced, it would, you know, this was how much it would cost. And because it's not priced, it adds up to $5 trillion a year. But that's a ridiculous argument. 
It's a totally stupid argument. The, and most of the subsidies on, on carbon, on, on, on fuels, are for poor people in countries that happen to have oil, coal, and gas, who subsidize their population's use of those things. Now, is that a good policy or not? That's another matter. But the fact of the matter is, if you're an oil producing company, country like Trinidad, it kind of makes nice, it makes sense that Trinidadians shouldn't pay the global market price for oil when they've got all of the problems in their backyards of oil drilling. And the same is true of gas, so it should be done. And this is what Mexico has done in its renationalization of the energy sector that's going on right now as we speak. So I think there's ways of articulating this in a class way, focus on the big consumers, then really push energy conservation as a, as a public works agenda, not just domestically, but as an international approach. There's 60% of the buildings that will be built by 2030 have not been built yet. And that's a reality. So the building of new buildings could be built to new standards with, with strong regulations on energy conservation and use. That could be done as part of a regulatory approach. So sorry to be a bit wonky and boring towards the end, but I think that's this. These are the kind of arguments I think um, that when workers say, well, am I going to have to pay for this? We say no. You know, obviously we want reasonable stewardship and use of resources. We don't want people to, you know, put 16 fans on and, uh, you know, an air conditioner and leave the, leave the TV on all day. Whether the electricity, if the electricity was free, that for them, that would still be an irresponsible use. But through digitalization, we can do a lot in terms of sensors of, of reducing energy, but they are not the focus of our politics. The focus of our politics are the big users because they are the ones who can make the, uh, the most in terms of reductions. And that is true in the power sector, but it's also true in transportation as well. Road transport is 70% of transport related emissions globally, and the movement of trucks around the world is growing. SUVs, that could be prevented. We could regulate SUVs or get rid of them and tell companies you are not producing a single SUV after 2025 or whatever it may be. And there's, you know, there's all sorts of things could be done in terms of mobility to reduce emissions. That when a vehicle that does 20 miles to the gallon is an absolute disgrace. And we should, and I don't care how much money you got, you shouldn't own that vehicle and you shouldn't be driving it. So I think that's that's the stuff working class people, many of whom are increasingly not car owners, by the way. Car ownership amongst working class is going down in many parts of the world. So I think we could win on those arguments and people would begin to believe that we do have an alternative and that's gonna be crucial in terms of shaping a whole global public goods narrative in the future. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Sean. <clears throat> I had hoped I had planned to go around to the panelists and give them a chance to come back, but we've had another hand and I want to go to someone who's not had a chance to speak yet, if that's okay, just very, very briefly. Um, we do need to end quickly because of the interpreters. We can't abuse the, their labor uh, beyond a, a, a very minimal grace period. So, uh, Victoria Avendano, if you could uh, uh, tell us where you're from and, and please uh, give us your contribution. Eh, muchas gracias. Buenas tardes de acá desde Colombia, desde la Central Unitaria de Trabajadores. Pues un abrazo para todos y todas y muy contenta, muy feliz de estar aquí aprendiendo de todos y cada uno de, de ustedes. Excelentes intervenciones, pero quiero comentarles algo en relación con el tema en lo que tiene que ver con nosotros en, en Colombia. O sea, Colombia es un país de Sudamérica, el primer país de Sudamérica, en donde desafortunadamente tenemos uno de los gobiernos que aplica con mayor profundidad la política neoliberal en tal sentido de que aquí ninguno de los servicios que ustedes han llamado que deben ser servicios públicos son realmente servicios públicos. Aquí todo, absolutamente todo está privatizado el servicio de energía, el servicio de agua, el servicio de transporte, todo está privatizado, incluso el servicio de la salud. Y comentarles que aquí en Colombia eh, económicamente dependemos de la venta de minero energéticos y que tenemos las dos minas de carbón más grandes del mundo eh, en los departamentos del Cesar y la Guajira, 
en manos de transnacionales, de la transnacional Glencore y la transnacional Drummond, fundamentalmente, y que el 70%, como les estoy diciendo, de la economía, de las entradas, de las divisas que llegan a la economía de nuestro país, llega por la venta de esos productos mineroenergéticos. Aquí no se consume, como acaba de decir el compañero que hizo su intervención. Aquí se vende esa energía. Pero desafortunadamente, aquí en Colombia, eso ha generado grandes problemas de tipo ambiental, porque las multinacionales que la explotan aquí en Colombia tienen toda la complicidad o el visto bueno del gobierno nacional para que hagan una minería poco amable con el medio ambiente, en donde secan las fuentes de agua. Aquí tenemos el 50% de los páramos del mundo y el gobierno nacional entrega permisos para hacer minería en estos páramos que es donde nacen los ríos que abastecen de agua los hogares de nuestro país. Y entonces aquí lo que vemos es una decisión, una política de Estado precisamente de favorecer los intereses de las multinacionales y no de defender los derechos de su pueblo. Aquí para nosotros existía hace muchísimos años el, el transporte de trenes y eso lo privatizaron y terminaron entregándosela a las multinacionales del carbón para que sean ellas las que utilicen este transporte de manera exclusiva para sacar el carbón de nuestro país y llevarlo a los puertos en donde son embarcados en grandes barcazas para llevarlos al resto del mundo, al sitio donde realmente se consume el carbón que se saca en nuestro país. Entonces, es una situación que vivimos supremamente difícil. La lucha que adelantamos desde la Central Unitaria de Trabajadores, desde los sindicatos mineroenergéticos, es una lucha por la soberanía nacional, por la defensa de lo público, por la democratización de la energía, por por la defensa de los derechos democráticos de los trabajadores y trabajadoras y por el derecho a la vida, porque las comunidades que viven aledañas a las explotaciones mineras de estas multinacionales ven diariamente amenazada su vida porque son desplazadas permanentemente para poder entregarle sus territorios a estas multinacionales para la explotación del carbón fundamentalmente. Es una situación que vivimos aquí. Ustedes han relatado que lo viven en diferentes países, pero aquí en Colombia la situación se vive en una dimensión mayor. En esa lucha estamos y ya estamos con ustedes y de la mano sabemos que vamos a lograr a nivel mundial con esa solidaridad sindical que nos caracteriza, vamos a lograr en algún momento que las cosas se den como le estamos planteando. Muchas gracias y un abrazo para todos y todas. Thanks very much, Victoria. Um, with that, I think we are at time. Unfortunately, I think we're not going to be able to take any more responses or, or comments, but thank you again to everyone, to STUC for hosting us, to the other organizing organizations, PSI, UNCTAD, um, and thank you to the interpreters very much. Yeah. Are there any final closing housekeeping comments? Or are we done? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. If you want to turn your camera on and unmute and and give a greeting farewell, please do. You have ten, 10 seconds. seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Thanks I did everyone it. for joining. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Emily, Bye. Lala, Simon. Thank <laughs> you.